Thanks very much, and thanks for having me. And my name is Jonathan Cedar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of BioLite. So maybe I'll just start with like a very quick introduction of, of my background. Um, BioLite is my first um, business endeavor, um, other than managing my band in college. So I, BioLite's my first business endeavor. Um, and um, just a very quick version of my history. So I studied engineering as an undergrad in college. Um, and went to work for a consumer product development firm where we were making like really tangible widgets that you hold with your hands like potato peelers for OXO or you know uh, printer housings for Hewlett Packard or um, you know beverage dispensers for Pepsi right so like really physical things and um, I, I would say the one skill I had before starting BioLite was I knew how to make things pretty well that was sort of something that was um, just something I really had a lot of interest in since I was a kid and, and, and honed in a professional way for about five years at this product development firm. And BioLite started as a night and weekend project inside of this product development firm, which was really just kind of a personal passion. We wanted, my, my co-founder who was a colleague at, at Smart Design and I, um, we were both avid campers and we wanted to see if we could make a stove that burned wood instead of gas so you didn't have to carry these annoying kind of toxic gas cylinders that run out in the middle of your meal at the wrong time all the time. So, um, and it was really through a very organic discovery process while in our day jobs that we stumbled into A, a technology which was pretty different than had been seen before in the cooking space, and, and B, um, a need that was much larger than our own for, you know, clean cooking um, in developing countries. And so, um, you know, after a couple of years of nights and weekends, I left my job and um, spent about 18 months. I joined a social enterprise incubator in Bombay and worked with Indian social entrepreneurs to try and understand the market and the customer better than I could from, you know, here in New York. Um, and um, eventually we raised a first round of venture capital, which is what allowed us to kind of get started in earnest. Um, I think there are a lot of other ways to start a business today that, um, in 2010, um, I don't think we're quite as available. Um, for example, I think Kickstarter is an awesome way to start a company. Um, uh, but given that we were a hardware company um, that was going to require a lot of capital, uh, we decided to go kind of the, the straight ahead venture capital route. And um, uh, so with that, I guess let me talk you through uh, what we do at BioLite and what we're focused on. and then. I'll try and keep that pretty brief so I can answer your guys' questions, which will probably be more interesting than my presentation. So, um, so uh, as I, you know, as um, as we started saying, you know, BioLite is a personal scale energy company, and I think the first step to understanding what we do is understanding what we mean by energy. And I think a great place to start to understand that is in, you know, an average American kitchen. Maybe this is a slightly upscale average American kitchen, but, um, you know. In this one place, we have an incredible, oops, sorry, rough formatting here. Um, uh, we have an incredible number of touch points for energy. So we have um, heat for cooking. We have um, electricity for lighting. Um, we have uh, energy for communications. We have energy for small appliances. We have energy to keep our food um, fresh. We have energy that brings us clean water, right? And so these are all many of the touch points of modern life that keep us safe and productive and comfortable and entertained, right? Um, but it turns out that um, that form of those forms of energy access aren't universal, right? They're um, about half the planet uh, gets the vast majority of their energy by burning wood. Um, so uh, using India as, ex as an example, 80% of all residential, and energy, uh, residential energy in India comes from burning wood, and it's used very inefficiently. About 15% of that energy makes it into your food to do what you want, and 85% of that energy is wasted into the environment as mostly heat, but also um, what are called products of incomplete combustion, so uh, this sort of toxic cocktail of particles and smoke and carbon monoxide and NOx and tars and um, kind of all the same stuff that's in cigarette smoke, except this is burning on the ground and cigarettes burn in your mouth, right? And, um, and, and as I mentioned, right, this is, this is the case for about half the planet, and um, about a quarter of the planet also lacks access to electricity for um, lighting, uh, communications, 
refrigeration, right? All, the, all those things we saw in the American kitchen. Um, uh, and um, the costs for these primitive energy systems are really profound, certainly economically for the individuals. Here in the United States, we spend about 4% of our income on energy for cooking, lighting, driving our cars, talking on our cell phones. Um, in, in India and, and many places in sub-Saharan Africa, families spend upwards of 30% of their income purchasing wood or charcoal and paying to have their cell phones recharged at you know, local kiosks and purchasing kerosene for lighting, right? And that's, these are people with a lot less disposable income than a lot of people here in New York, right? And so that's, that's a pretty huge burden. Um, in addition to that, smoke from open fires is the number one cause of environmental premature death in the world. It kills more people than HIV, TB, and malaria combined, and there really haven't been good technologies to address this. Um, and then all that smoke doesn't just affect the individuals, but um, you know it then wafts up into the atmosphere and is a huge um, influencer on climate change, both from a CO2 standpoint and also for the dark particles. Um, so, sorry, bit of a downer to start, but it gets better. Um, so, what, um, you know, as I mentioned, we didn't start out trying to, you know, save the world. We started out trying to solve a personal need, which was how do we go camping and not carry gas cans? And um, what we were observing was you can actually make wood burn really cleanly, right? If you see a car driving down the street with smoke coming out of the tailpipe, you'd say to yourself, that's a really badly tuned car, right? And it needs a tune up. And, and if you see a campfire burning on the ground with smoke coming out of it, it's really the same thing, right? Like, it's a badly tuned fire. And we can tune fires so that they can burn basically as cleanly as a well-tuned car can drive. Um, and the way that you do that is um, you insulate them, so you keep them really, really hot, so all of the potential energy in your fuel can react into just heat and CO2 and water vapor. Um, and then what you need to do is you need to more vigorously mix the fuel with the oxygen, right? And in order to do that, you need a fan to kind of stir up this combustion mixture. Um, and so the question became, well, all right, if that's what you need to do to burn wood as a really clean fuel, um, how do we do that without batteries or a plug in the wall? And um, what we started thinking was, well, hey, there's 5,000 watts of thermal energy in an average cooking fire. Um, we need one watt to power this you know, little fan. Um, are there some ways to kind of take that thermal energy and move it over to electrical energy. And after looking at a whole bunch of things like wind-ups and spring motors and not, you know, a whole bunch of different things, we, we started to look at this technology called thermoelectrics, which are, thermoelectrics are basically solar panels for heat instead of light. They're solid state, semiconductor, very reliable, don't degrade over time devices. Um, and um, while they're not tremendously efficient, so I don't think thermoelectrics are gonna save you know, they're not gonna solve the world's energy crisis. What they're really good at is, you've got a ton of energy here and we need to make a tiny bit of it into electrical energy. And um, they were kind of this, this little magic conversion piece. And what we found was, we were able to make enough electricity, not just to power these fans and make wood burn like gas, but also um, to bring a little bit of energy access to these off-grid situations where you could then go charge a phone or charge an LED light. And so what we created was a product that we call the home stove. And um, through these advanced combustion dynamics, we're able to um, reduce smoke emissions by about 95%, um, uh, eliminate black carbon, which is a very potent climate forcer. Um, we're able, because we insulate the fire so well and we help focus that heat into your food, we can help reduce the amount of fuel you're using um, by about 50%, which saves families a lot of time and money. Um, and then we can generate electricity, which you know about half of the homes burning wood don't have, and that's that's very economically valuable um, for the family. Um, since this is an entrepreneurship course, um, and again with apologies, I think the slide formats have made the words a little funny, but um, I thought I would just kind of run through our business model. So because um, we don't do it all, we do pieces of it, right? So the pieces that we're really good at, or we're you know working to become really good at our um, product. So we have a team of 17 scientists in um, combustion engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, industrial design, and, and ma manufacturing. Um, and so we're really good at starting from what we call first principles and diving deep into problems and finding the opportunities that exist in a way that you can't necessarily find them off the shelf. Um, so we're, we're really good at technology. Um, 
given that we come from an industrial design, do, do folks know what industrial design is? Is it show of hand? So for anyone who doesn't, industrial design is basically the the study of how people interact with objects, right? And how we think about um, very specifically users and the way to design objects so that they are intuitive and efficient for users. Um, um, so, so we think that we're, you know, we're pretty good at taking this technology and putting it in a format um, that's pretty intuitive to people, right? It's kind of like why, you know, thumbing through the menus on your iPhone, it's, you kind of get where to go, and, you know, better than you used to be able to on your Palm Pilot, maybe, right? And, like, that's an example of really good, good design. Um, so we think we're good at that. And then we can manufacture these things cost effectively, but what we're not necessarily going to be good at as a company is, um, you know, reaching hundreds of thousands of rural villages where we don't have the relationships, we don't necessarily have the brand recognition yet, we don't necessarily have the trust of the end consumer, and so we partner for distribution with a whole bunch of um, small energy distribution businesses, either selling solar lights or um, water purifiers or kind of these sort of essential goods in rural markets. Um, and then we're able to um, subsidize uh, a small piece of that through, um, or maybe I should say catalyze, because one is a subsidy and one is not. One is we work with partners to create micro loans for our purchasers so that they don't necessarily need all of the cash um, at the time of purchase. Our stoves sell for about $50, which is what an average cell phone sells for in, in these rural markets. Um, but so we're able to work with microfinance organizations to say, okay, pay us $10 now and then pay us you know, a few dollars a month for the rest of the year and then you've paid off your product. Um, and then the other thing we're able to do, um, or we're uh, working to become able to do, is to take the fact that our stoves reduce climate emissions and sell those back to industrial polluters who need to um, uh, find cost-efficient ways to reduce their total pollution. And so for the poorest of our customer segments, we're working to be able to reallocate these what are called carbon credits to help subsidize their purchases. And so, um, so anyway, the part on the left is what we do, and then the part on the right is what we look to partners to do. Um, and just, um, just a, a fun anecdote on the climate side of things. Um, so I, I think sometimes when we think about how to solve climate change, we think about driving Toyota Priuses or, or the like. Um, maybe now it's the Nissan Leaf. Um, and if you actually looked at the cost of averting a ton of CO2 by buying a hybrid, it would be between $500 and $1,000. If you look at the cost of averting a ton of CO2 by putting an efficient stove in someone's house, it's about 100 times less expensive. Um, so we really think that this can be a very economical way um, to, to help promote you know, uh, climate conserving actions. Um, so today we're working um, primarily in three countries um, distributing our products. We work in northeast India. Um, we work in Uganda in and around Kampala, which is the capital region. Um, and then we work in uh, northwest Ghana. Um, and we, over the last, um, it took us about three years to develop the home stove. Uh, and over the last 18 months that it's been in market, we've sold a little over 10,000 of them. And, and we believe... Um, uh, that the way we're going to get to scale is through commercial mechanisms, and so we want our end users to value and be able to afford and pay for our products because we don't think there's a philanthropy in the world big enough to service three billion people, which equates to roughly 500 million households. And so, you know, for us to really have the impact we want to have, we need to do this in a way that's going to be market-driven, in the same way that no one went and gave, you know, a couple billion cell phones out in these markets. People saved up and you know companies were able to produce them at costs that were affordable to individuals and and that's how they that's how they grew their markets and we want to do the same thing um, that said um, we're not going to get there overnight and so we've come up with a business model that helps us incubate the um, what we call the the one-time market establishment cost right so um, it costs a lot of money to develop product. It costs a lot of money to go out and embed our staff with our distributors to help them be really efficient um, in how they get product to customers and how they support those customers over time. Um, and so we've come up with this model that we call parallel innovation, where we take these same technologies that were created for solving energy problems in emerging markets, and we commercialize them in parallel um, 
in recreation markets where people have the same kinds of energy needs, it's just one's by choice and one's by circumstance, right? And, um, and so the, the little brother of the home stove we call the camp stove, it's the exact same technology, but made in a format that fits in your backpack and burns you know, the twigs that are on the trail of your, your camping um, you know, backpack. Um, and um, we've been able to engage retailers like REI and L.L. Bean um, to help us sell these products. And what we do is we take the, the near-term profits from this business and we reinvest it to help us grow our emerging markets business to scale. Um, and so through this model, you know, while we did need to raise some venture capital just to start the business at all, we think that this is a tool that's helped us, um, A, mitigate risk for our investors, right? I think, I think it's fair to say that trying to serve, you know, a half billion homes with pretty expensive technology um, in hard to reach places is a risky business model, right? Like there's, there's no two ways around that. We, we sure think we've got the best shot of getting it right of anybody, but it, you know, this is risky investment for investors. And, um, and what we're able to do is by essentially being our own internal source of investment capital, we can mitigate that risk for investors, we can uh, make sure that the company has more runway to solve a problem that's going to take more time and more capital than a lot of other problems. Um, and that at the, uh, at the end of the day, what we hope we deliver to all of our stakeholders what we, is what we call social return on investment. And this is, in addition to financial returns for our investors, we think that every time we sell a product, we can deliver you know, a healthier environment that uses less fuel from, you know, from the surroundings, um, that is healthy for the climate and that you know, provides what we see really as a universal right, which is access to electricity, which um, you know, is the thing that, makes us, that takes us from a 12-hour functional day to a 16-hour functional day and lets us communicate um, and have all of these things that we saw in, in that you know, initial American kitchen. So um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's, that's kind of the overview. Um, would love to answer any questions.